to She Shield, your one stop pod for all topics personal safety. I'm your host, Sophia, and my goal is to help educate women and men on concealed carry, martial arts, and all topics self defense. Before we start today, please take a moment to rate the podcast. So many of you all have already gone and done this, so thank you so much for that. And I would like to mention that we are posting the full video on YouTube. So if you would like to watch this episode on YouTube, I do highly recommend it. We have some incredible guest speakers. Yes, speakers, plural. Um, So if you guys want to take the opportunity to go to YouTube and watch it there, this is the time to do that. This episode is sponsored by Big Tech's Ordnance, your soon-to-be favorite retailer for all of your firearms needs. BTO believes in only selling high-quality gear for responsibly responsibly armed citizens, as well as providing pre- and post-sale support. BTO values firearms training and supports instructors nationwide. They do this so that when you call as the consumer, you are taken care of. Thank you so much to BTO. Let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, But I would love to go back to what you mentioned earlier, Steve, and that is uh, actions that should be taken following a gunshot wound to maximize chances of survival and recovery. Um, I would love for you all to just kind of take this topic and run, if you don't mind, as far as uh, we can maybe start with the just civilian side. What should someone be? How should someone be prepared uh, to treat a gunshot wound? Well, first thing, of course, is just going to be starting with the training and the knowledge how to do that under, you know, much less austere situations. And then how much gear can you carry on your person on a daily basis? And what do you carry? And so for me, I've got one of the, uh, well, golly. I can't remember the name of it. I just lost it. It was that, oh, the snake staff, the one and a half inch tourniquet. And I carry a uh, a, sea, a deal of sea, sea locks, uh, gauze. And that's pretty much all I carry. If I'm working a church security detail, I'll also stick a pressure dressing, you know, a four inch pressure dressing in my back pocket. And just, you know, having that on a daily basis, especially kind of living out here in the country and having grandkids, etc. I think that's a good thing to do, whether you're concealed care or not. And I'm the person that knows the least of this about anybody. So I probably should have been the last one to insert anything. I think that was a great intro to break it down into training and gear and, you know, just what to carry. So I actually really appreciate you going into that. Um, but yeah, would, would anyone else kind of like to uh, sure, I'll I'll take on. the reins on that? Right, good, yeah. John. Well, I'll jump in on that. I, I just went to a uh, training with a guy named Mark Fricky up in uh, devil's tower, a uh, mutual friend of a lot of us. And I was there and I was one of three physicians that were there one orthopedic surgeon and I forget the other guy's specialty, but I happened to overhear a physician actually telling me that he we needed to be really concerned about putting tourniquets on people in a civilian EMS system because of the t- amount of time that it would be on and all of the, um, I'm trying to think of a nicer way of saying horse shit that used to be talked about um, tourniquets. And this is a physician who's at a training program in shooting. And I took him aside and I said, you know, when you start talking about the detriments and all of the things that we used to say about being worried about putting on tourniquets to people who don't have a full understanding of what you're talking about, you really are doing them a disservice because so many people have bled out because of people being afraid to put on tourniquets that put them on early, put them on often, just like voting, do those things when you can, as fast as you can. And don't worry about all the stuff that we used to be taught about. You're putting a dotted line where the amputation is going to be when the surgeon's eventually going to take the leg off. You're sacrificing a limb to save a life. And this guy still thought that stuff. And he's an orthopedic surgeon. And I I just, I, I was blown away by the the lack of being current in what we know based on what's happened with the global war on terror and getting tourniquets into people's hands fast and getting them on, on extremity wounds. We've saved so many lives and not had significant complications related to those. So I just wanted to get on, on that. And there's so much stuff that is still being put out there by people. I've also been to people who, I've talked to people who've taken stop the bleed classes 
and they've heard the same stuff. And I've just had to say, no, 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 that is just not what we teach anymore. It's not what we think anymore. It's not what we believed for decades. And that, that still is being put out there and it's, it's terrible. So I'll add to that, uh, to expand on my introduction earlier, I started my career as a paramedic and my very first class as a first responder, I was taught then that you put the tourniquet on so the surgeon would know where to amputate. And for years and years, it's just like Troy said, it was the last thing that you did. Now I am the EMS medical director for the largest EMS district in my state. And I push tourniquets because when a paramedic is in the back of the unit, they've got to take care of the patient, get vital signs, start IV, give pain medicine, uh, give a report to the, uh, to the hospital. And they're the only person there. And so I'm a firm believer of getting tourniquets on as soon as possible, not just for arterial bleeds. Most people don't carry extra blood with them. The only blood you have is what you've got. So the best chance you have to survive is to not let what you've got come out. So I've seen more people use tourniquets in a non-shooting scenario than I have a shooting scenario. I have had tourniquets put on by pre-hospital providers for bad car crashes, partial amputation, chainsaw injury, uh, falling through a glass window. Uh, I've had more tourniquets used in the non-shooting environment than the shooting environment, and I'm a firm believer of very least keeping a tourniquet on you at all times. Um, as far as wound packing and things like that, sometimes I do, but majority of the time I just have my tourniquet because my theory is unless I'm going to an active shooter scenario in a nudist colony, there's going to be something I can use to pack into a wound. So, uh, but anyway, please carry a tourniquet at the very least. Yeah, the biggest reason to carry the biggest reason to carry a tourniquet as the one piece of life saving gear that you're going to carry is you can improvise all the other things that you need. And as soon as you hear somebody tell you that I'm just going to go find a stick and I'm going to use my belt and I'm going to improvise a tourniquet, stop listening to them and walk out of the room because it's it's just not going to work. You have to have tourniquets that are made specially to do that purpose driven with you. Or by the time you gather the gear, the game is going to be over. Yes. I have never seen someone come in with a belt on as a tourniquet that was working as a tourniquet. Uh, in the Boston bombing, I understand every tourniquet that was used. That was not a commercial tourniquet. Every one that was used failed. They slowed down the bleeding, but they did not stop the bleeding. I had a guy that, that uh, did a pretty good job of trying to take his arm off at just below his elbow with a skill saw that he'd taken the uh, the safety guard and taped it back and was running a skill saw and yep. on a ladder. And he lost skill. control and woo, right across a skill saw. What did I say? A kill saw? A skill, skill saw. Skill saw. Yeah. Anytime yeah. I have a yeah. patient, that's skill. I have to put that in quotations. <laughs> yeah. That's air quotes probably would have been a good thing. Uh, this guy was brought in by his own. His the construction workers are kind of like the Marines. They bring their own in. They uh, they didn't wait for EMS. I was in a little hospital. Uh, Andy's experiences with level one trauma centers. I worked all the way down to level three and fours, which... Or like, if you want to be in the trauma residency and you have a box of band-aids, you can be a level four trauma center. Um, this, these people didn't have a tourniquet in the emergency department. So I went out to my car and I grabbed mine. I did not have mine on my, in my pocket then, but we heard this guy was coming in. And I've got some great pictures someday when I'll, I'll show you that uh, if you come to the class, I'll, I'll happily show you a Hispanic guy who was looking more pale than you, Sophia. Very, very, <laughs> very white. Uh, because he was running out of blood. Uh, tried to bleed to death. We've got the belt that the boys that brought him in had put on and tried to tighten, and it didn't work. And he left a blood trail that a blind man could have followed coming into the ER. They wheeled him in in a, in a wheelchair. And it wasn't drops of blood. It was a steady stream. Uh, that was coming out of the, uh, the arm, uh, put a cat on him, 
transferred him to a level one trauma center and uh, he kept his arm and he kept his life moreover. So improvised tourniquets don't work. So that is the one piece of gear that I would recommend people carry if they're going to do that. The other stuff you can improvise. This is so interesting, by the way. Um, I have a confession. Okay. I taught the first aid course that basically most exercise science majors have to take at the Arkansas State University uh, like a year and a half to two years ago. Um, It's honestly scary the qualifications I had to have for it, which were close to none. Um, but all that to say, I was a, a master's student. I needed a job. So they put me with first aid and just to get the students interested and in off of their phones. Um, cause even though I was like close to their age, they did not want to listen to me. It's a scary world we live in today. Moving on. Uh, we did an improvised tourniquet portion, uh, just to show them like how you would build one. But uh, we then went on to look at some pretty uh, popular brands like Cat Tourniquets, North American Rescue, uh, and also what not what tourniquets not to buy, like ones off of Amazon, for example. So we went into like where you can go to purchase those. And I sent them like an email with links on how to purchase them. Um, but I, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I, I did them a disservice. I mean, by showing them that based on what you guys have talked about. So, uh, for those of you listening, if this is uh, news to you, then, um, better to learn it now than never, but, um, I still have their emails. Maybe I should send them a follow up. Be like, Hey guys, it's been a while, but scratch what I said. Um, yeah, it's it, actually the videos we, we looked up some videos and they were kind of trending videos on TikTok about people, you know, doing like a step-by-step to make an improvised tourniquet. So, um, there's another example of the media just misinforming, but, uh, for types of brands of tourniquets that you all recommend, uh, what would you say to the listeners? And we can link it in the show notes. Cats and softy wides, I think are the time tested, well-proven ones. Uh, Annie, I, I think we've talked about this before and I, I think you agree. When, whenever someone asks me that question, I ask them, I've got the cat and soft tea that has been used thousands and thousands of times in battle on the streets, proven to work. Or I've got ABC tourniquet that's brand new, that's Whoa. never been really tried, but it's 10 okay. bucks cheaper. Which one do you want to bet your life on? <laughs> Very nice. Wait, and Steve, what was the one you mentioned earlier that, not to put you on the spot? Oh, it's a snake staff. It's basically, it's just like a small cat. Uh, it's yeah. relatively small. Uh, now, well, and actually, yeah, they came out cat. with an inch and a half version. It's a skinny cat. So this one is an inch and a half versus the one inch version. Mm-hmm. And uh, while I acknowledge that it's probably not as good as a cat, I can't carry a cat with me everywhere I go where I can stick that in my pocket all the time so i kind of view this as the difference between this is like a sig 365 and a cat's going to be like a glock 17 or full-size sig 320 so yeah it may not be as good but i do have it on me and i do have it on me all the time but it's basically a small cat because it's basically right it still has the windlass right good deal who was the gun company that used to say in a world of compromise some people don't was that was that h and k i think <laughs> Well, good for you, because my whole <laughs> life is about compromise. Uh, I'm really glad that there are people that don't compromise. Well, everybody compromises. You know, we don't carry shotguns all day, every day. If we wanted to really not worry about this whole where to shoot people thing, we carry shotguns with us all day, every day. But that's not how the world works. So I'm completely in agreement with what you're saying, Steve, that it everything is a compromise and that's a darn good one. That's a darn good one. Wonderful. Well, I will link all of those in the show notes, the show notes and, and the email I send my former students. <clears throat> so thank you all for <laughs> going into detail. Um, and just to, to emphasize this, would you say there is ever a time where someone should leave the tourniquet at home? Oh, oh sure. A swimming home? pool. You know, okay. you keep it on your bag. Yes. I mean, I, to me, I, I tell you what, as soon as I put my pants on, I put a gun on and I put my 
tourniquet on along with i always go ahead and carry a little you know quick clot gauze there in case i need to stick it in a hole you know in an armpit or a you know because that may be relatively difficult to do but like uh you know uh, these other gentlemen were saying i can definitely make a pressure dressing or you know something i can pack and make a bit of a pressure dressing out of a garment right and for maybe a first aid kit where someone has the space available to so say like their car or uh, if you're an instructor and you provide a first aid kit for a course that you're teaching, uh, what would you say should be in that first aid kit in addition to a tourniquet? More training. Ah, yes. It, yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean that to sound flippant. It probably does. And let me back up and try and make it as unflippant as I can. Um, talk about this in the talk that I give and we'll be talking about it. But Pat Rogers was the guy who I heard attributed the old saying about mission driving the gear train. If you know and have enough training to know what you need to accomplish as a first responder, you know that what the mission is, you're going to know what the gear is that you need to accomplish the mission. I'm not a carpenter, but if I was a carpenter and I was going to go out and build a house, I know I'd need a, a way to cut the lumber and I'd need a way to drive the nails and put the screws in. I just built a deck this not too long ago. And I, I, I gathered my tools because I knew what I was going to go do. If you have the training up to the point where you know what you need to do, whether that's stopping bleeding, decompressing attention pneumothorax, if you're trained to do so, putting a tourniquet on, you better have that tourniquet. If you're going to pack a wound, you better have some wound packing. If you're going to open an airway, you better have a way of opening an airway. If you're trained to do that surgically, you better have a sharp knife. You, what I'm saying is, is that if you know what the mission is that you need to perform, you're not going to need anybody to tell you the list. So when somebody asks me the, or, or wants to know what should I carry in my first aid kit, that really is my flippant answer is you'd know already what to put in your first aid kit. If you knew how to do the things and you knew the skill sets that you were going to have to have like building a house, I can't give you a, I'm not going to give you a list of tools to a carpenter if I'm going to ask him to build my house for me. And if I want to learn how to build the house, the first thing I'm going to learn is what I'm going to do. And then I'll gather the tools that I need to do it. That's a long winded answer of my explanation of more training needs to go in your kit. And your training and background also is going to impact what you put in your kit. And because exactly, of me, because I have so many people that's come into the ER, that's John Doe. I know nothing about them. I know that's <laughs> important information. So I actually stopped on the side of the interstate where someone was hit by a vehicle. And before he passed out, the first response did a good job. We stopped the bleeding. We stabilized the femur fracture. But then I started asking questions. And I had a Sharpie. And I put his name, birthday, Social Security, known on drug allergy, positive ETOH on his chest because I knew there was a possibility he was going to lose consciousness between the time the paramedics got there and the time they got him to the hospital. Or he could have lost consciousness before the paramedics ever showed up. So as soon as we stabilized him to the best of our ability, I started putting information down, and I just put a sharpie and wrote it directly onto the skin of his chest. He wasn't going to lose that piece of paper because it was on his chest. And I understand the ER people was really excited whenever they opened the chest up to the exam and saw all their information right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Got my history so what done. I'm hearing is you have a sharpie in I your do. first aid kit. Yes. Along with, no, that yeah, makes along sense. with, you know, the typical dressing, wound seal, needle decompression, tourniquet, extra tourniquet. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, first of all, incredible story. That's uh, very inspiring. Um, what would you say? So, I, I know earlier you all mentioned uh, Stop the Bleed courses. Uh, I recently went to one and... I did not learn much. I'm not... I think it was great that it was... It was free. It was accessible. It was uh, something that was put on by my local range. So all of the 
not all of the, excuse me, um, about, I'd say 15 members from the range where I shoot USPSA were there. Um, so that was really cool to see like, okay, these people actually care. Um, I know who I'm squatting with, you know what I mean? Um, but in your experience, uh, with stop the bleed, would you recommend it to someone who say is listening to this episode and they just, they feel inspired because they realize how much they didn't know from this episode, uh, to go to the course. Would you recommend that? And you can start there soon. That's also, you know, being able to go and do it next week as opposed to have to wait for a course that's in a month or two months. I would definitely go that route. And I I went that route recently. Now, in some instances, I kind of came out of that class feeling a little bit dumber than I went in. But by the same token, uh, okay, you know, I knew I it also tended to validate some of the training that I had. So I'd be I'd, I'd advocate that. It really depends on so many different factors. Is the person who's teaching that got a background that's broad and deep and they can bring that into the stop the bleed class, then you're going to have a wonderful experience. If it's somebody who, um, sticks to the curriculum, which is pretty basic, and doesn't augment it with a bunch of going back to what I talked about earlier. Uh, we talked to people that had just been through a stop the bleed class and got a whole bunch of the happy horse crap that, that we used to talk about tourniquets directly from that. And were telling me that's what they'd learned. Um, there's a problem, but so it, it really depends. The problem is it's, it's very hard from a consumer level to be able to vet your instructors when you go to one of those. So it's kind of like a a concealed carry class or an NRA basic pistol class, which I took from Carl Wren, who teaches NRA basic pistol. And Carl Wren is a fabulous instructor. And he said, this is what the NRA teaches and wants me to teach you here. And this is the way it really is. But I didn't say any of that because it's an NRA class. It, It wasn't quite like that, but Carl, you know, that was, that was absolutely not a waste of my time. It would have been, I think from what I've heard about a lot of those classes, it's a very early thing. I needed that certification because it's the only certification that the Boy Scouts recognizes. Um, and when I went through it, a lot of the basic information that was there was kind of like being taught the alphabet when you already had a PhD in English lit. It, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to waste that time, but I needed the certification. If you're in that boat with stop the bleed. Sure. Uh, if it's like Steve said, it's a great place to start, but look at it like a concealed carry class. If you really want to go get some training, you're going to need to go well beyond that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, all I know is there weren't enough pool noodles to go around. So I did not get to practice my wound packing. I'm pretty upset about that, but, um, all it did was show me what I need to do going forward. So, um, (laughs) yes. Uh, so, uh, and of course, you know, I, I have a husband who's a paramedic and I've been meeting to utilize him as a resource to, to learn some of that. But, um, yeah, that's, that goes into the whole, should you teach your spouse things? So I'll move on from that right now. But, um, I would love to know how do you all implement these lessons into the summit or how do you plan on implementing them? Are you searching for a brand you can trust when it comes to shooting and gun care products? Look no further than Birchwood Casey. Since 1948, serious shooters, avid collectors, and professional gunsmiths have relied on Birchwood Casey. They've been in the game for over 70 years, providing us with products that have stood the test of time. From their legendary True Oil gunstock finish to the dependable Perma Blue, Birchwood Casey's commitment to quality is unmatched. Birchwood Casey has also revolutionized the way we train and improve our shooting skills with their innovative shoot and see targets. These targets let you see your shots instantly, making it easier than ever to track your progress and become a better marksman. Head over to birchwoodcasey.com today and discover the products that have earned the trust of shooters worldwide. And use code SHESHIELD20 to save 20% on your order and to support the podcast. Again, that's SHESHIELD20, S-H-E-S-H-I-E-L-D, 20 at checkout. Happy shooting. This is the first summit, correct? This upcoming one? It is. 
Yeah, there'll be uh, just blocks of exercises. They'll have, you know, okay, so much time is going to be allotted to this one, and then we'll just follow that. We'll have uh, all of these will be pretty much about the same length in terms of uh, training time. So I don't know if that's the answer to your question or not, but there'll be a definite, okay, this is going to be there from, you know, 8 to 9.30, 10, to, you know, et cetera. Absolutely. So as far as things like tourniquet application and wound packing, is that something a student could expect they to will. That's going to be learn. part of I've been shot. Okay. okay. How to apply a tourniquet to yourself, how to put a pressure dressing on yourself, and uh, how to apply a chest seal to yourself. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's so exciting. I can't wait to learn from you all compared to uh, what I've done so far, which is minimal if you can't tell. Um, so would you all say that something like applying a tourniquet to yourself and others is a perishable skill once you learn it and if so how would you uh, implement that into your training either you know weekly monthly what do you guys recommend anything's a perishable skill so and and different people have different time restraints between job family things like that and you're trying to work out you're trying to go the range so you've only got a finite amount of time but it's not super super difficult to learn and once you do learn it i think probably as you think about it you know two or three times a year are probably fine some people overachievers may do it every week uh, but it's what you feel comfortable with some people have timers i've heard well they've got the the goal of getting it out of their pocket and in place within so many seconds so you could set up a training regimen where you're trying to uh, hit a magical time and then trying to beat your time so there's different ways that you could help reinforce the skills and train yourself. Yeah, I'd echo that completely. Um, I think if the first sight picture that you ever took across your defensive handgun was in the midst of an encounter in which you had to kill your, you, know, you had to kill somebody to survive, it probably isn't going to go very well for you. I think putting on tourniquets is kind of the same way. If, if you think that you're not going to have 10 left thumbs trying to apply a tourniquet when the first time you've taken one out of the package, which drives me crazy, that's another rant I could get off on, but I won't, um, is when you've got an arterial bleeder that's trying to put a spurt of blood in your face, it's probably not going to go very well. To your point, once you've learned how to do it, you can put it on your left arm, right arm, right thigh, left thigh yourself and then done that to a partner a couple of times and you it, primacy is far more important in this one than recency, but it, it's a pretty simple process, but it isn't one that you want to be trying to figure out while you're looking at an arterial bleeder for the first time. Something that I run into that, that I, that has stuck with me for a very long time on some of these, what we think of as simple tasks. Like, uh, you never, you know, you never forget how to ride a bike, that type of thing. So I saw a study that the U S army did on some of this task, like how often should you hit some of this stuff? And when I was uh, going through training in the eighties, uh, with the M 17 gas mask, well, we were taught to utilize that in basic training. We had the, you had the bag around your waist, it was on your leg. So the standard, because it was still the Cold War and the Russians were known to use like nerve gas and things like that, the standard was you had to have the mask out of the bag on your face and cleared in eight seconds and then the hood over and the zipper and the Velcro and things done because it, it was a hood as part of the gas mask to, to keep droplets and things off your head. That was 15 seconds for everything to be standard two standard so under eight seconds to have your mask on and cleared and then to have the hood on in you know the zippers and everything 15 seconds relatively simple task under pressure uh, we were taught in basic training to do that you know in the dark and and drill sergeants would yell gas 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 we did that all the time so the army did a study on task uh you know how how often do you have to train some of these things? And they used the M17 gas mask at two standard as a device to test that. What they found was if you had not trained on that task for six months, specifically the gas mask, about 90% of the people 
could still do it to standard in the time standard. What they found is if you went a year without training, that dropped to 50%. So the idea that, uh, you know, doing that, uh, uh, practicing on playing a tourniquet a couple times a year probably gets you by once you learn it good and solid. But you probably want to stick to that protocol because you don't want to be a year out and you know, now you're one of the 50 percenters. And you're a 50 percenter. Uh, the first time I saw an arterial squirter and you got blood shooting out of a human being three feet into the air, it's a pretty shocking moment in your life that, uh, you know, holy, holy crap, that, that's actually happening. I didn't know, you know, it would look quite that way. That, that that tends to discombobulate you a little bit. So having your whatever your skill set is, your draw stroke on your pistol, malfunction clearances, emergency braking on driving, things like that, having some of that at a good base so that you have some automaticity to the skills is always a good thing. And again, we have, you know, primacy of training and then how much time do we have in the day and that sort of thing. So I, I would probably say hitting that, you know, about every six months is probably a good thing to, to look at. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for that. That's an incredibly sobering thought. Um, I have a lot of work to do myself. So uh, that's incredible. Uh, Chuck, since uh or on you, I would love to know, do you have any memorable encounters uh, or from any historic gunfights you've studied where uh, medical equipment was utilized poorly uh, or anything like that that you would like to add to this? Um, yeah, there, there's <laughs> everything that I've ever, you know, all, all of the, the shooting incidents and uh, people being wounded, things like that, that I responded to. Uh, all, all had some lessons learned. Uh, I noted a lot of, so we, we were te- like in 1982, when I went through basic training, the, the army was teaching tourniquets and chest seals. And, uh, we didn't, we weren't taught wound packing, but we were taught uh, pressure dressings, things like that. So I had all that with me. The first time that I applied a tourniquet to a human being in a trauma situation was a rollover car wreck back in the 80s when people didn't commonly wear seat belts and a lady had got flipped out of a car and hit a guardrail with her leg cut her what i believe is probably her tibial artery in her calf and uh so uh, i was glad that i had that training in basic training back then from the army because it was super uncommon i didn't learn any of that in the police in fact we didn't i was one of the people at my department that pushed that training onto the rest of the department. Uh, it, it wasn't something that was brought to me or offered to me. We had like basic Red Cross first aid, things like that. Uh, so, you know, having, and not not to, to counterman Troy, but I, I didn't, so we didn't have store-bought tourniquets back then, but we were taught to have the materials to build a tourniquet immediately right away. So the first one, the first one I did, uh, I lost an army cravat and a mini mag light to, out of the deal. It, it went on the ambulance with the lady. So uh, the army, the old army cravat was what we were taught to use uh, to build tourniquets out of. And then we had battlefield wound dressings and things like that. But uh, I didn't go hunting for materials. I already had those with me, and I knew exactly how to use them um, fortuitously. A, there's other things that I can look at. Like I, I recall showing up on, on a shooting, and we didn't know where the shooter was, so we had a victim down. And this guy had uh, – you, you could you could he didn't have a big sucking chest wound, but you could see some bubbles coming out of one side of his chest. And the guys that I were with, because people have owies and you don't want to like hurt people, they were actually rolling him on to where where the bullet hole was up. And I had to yell at him to get him to roll the guy the other way. Is it gonna cause more pain for him to lay on the bullet hole? Yes, but you don't want the good lung down and then the bad lung is bleeding into the good lung and now he doesn't have any lungs left so that was one of those times right there in the middle of a street scenario where i'm like 
we've got to do a better job of taking care of business as a profession because we could have had uh, an officer facilitated uh, or assisted homicide. Uh, the bad guy didn't finish off the victim, but uh, our poor first aid could have facilitated turning a, a bad shooting into a homicide. So things like that uh, drove me to get more and more training in on stuff like this at, at the ditch medicine level. I'm, n- I'm never going to be one of these other guys. Uh, um, I don't have the, you know, I'm not a rocket surgeon in any way, shape or form. That's why I, I surround myself with smart people so that I can learn knuckle dragger skills. Uh, one of the things that, that I point out with tactical anatomy is there's always, there's always the double edged sword, the two sides of the coin. And if you, can recognize tactical anatomy both this helps you both with where to put bullets on the bad guy to shut them down as quickly as possible but also allows you to immediately look at somebody and triage the potential for the trauma that you're looking at and then what you're going to have to do to take care of that problem so the training is both uh You know, there's two aspects to to tactical anatomy that I point out to people. And one of them is the trauma first aid aspect and recognizing what you're looking at. I want to just step in for just a second because, Chuck, I'm not going to let you talk about my friend that way. Um, You, that is. I think if I was shot in the field, I would rather have you trying to take care of me than about 50 to 60% of the docs that I know at least. So it's not about book training out in the field. It's about hustle and muscle and knowing a few basic skills, being able to keep your feces all in one spherical place. (laughs) And I would trust you to do that. So what a compliment. And common sense goes a long way. I'm not a rocket surgeon either. Hmm. So common sense goes a long way. That's what's got me through. It's remarkably uncommon. That makes sense. It is. Every every time I go to work, <laughs> I find out. One of, my, one of my favorite questions that I ask patients. That's why, I do, that's why I'm retired and I don't go to work anymore. Because one of my favorite questions I ask when, patient, when patients come in, I'll say, well, <laughs> how'd that work out for you? Not yeah. too good. Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. That's what I'm, I I could probably speak for Andy on this one. I think we got into it for the stories that people tell. Uh, it, it never ceases to be entertaining and amazing. It didn't while I was still working. Absolutely. Anyway. Yeah. I found it. I found it really interesting. Uh, I think Caleb and I, uh, have some some pretty interesting careers at parties. You know, people get to ask questions about guns and about paramedics and his stories are always so much cooler. Um, but I did not realize he used to not tell me stories. He used to come home and he would worry that it would upset me. And now it's like my favorite thing. I'm like, so what happened today? He was like, Oh, nothing. Just welcome to the dark side. Basically band-aids and (laughs) right. Yes, absolutely. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Just while we're on this topic, uh, he had a night where he was late getting home and I'd cooked dinner and I was excited. We were going to watch a movie and have a little date night. And he was late and I was super bummed. And I was like, oh, babe, like you, you realize it, he you was know? late because you cooked dinner. That, that there, there, oh, there, yes, that's exactly there, where the story's there's, going. there's waves in the universe where things like this have a cause and effect. <laughs> I'm not saying he was avoiding you, <laughs> but it's kind of it's kind right, of like right, the right. guys that go, man, it sure is quiet tonight. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure, Chuck. Uh, no. So it turns out, though, he was uh, he was looking for a guy's head on the highway. And um, I got over my little, you know, I was like, oh, man, I hate that you were late. I was looking forward to the date night thing. You know what I'm talking about? And then um he was like, yeah, sorry, babe. We just couldn't find this guy's head. Took us a while. And I was like, oh my God, uh, never mind. I'm so sorry. Uh, Cause I don't have days like that. You know, he comes home. He's like, how was your day? And I was like, well, I had a meeting. Didn't that lose any crazy. heads. Um, 
you didn't lose exactly. any hits. Exactly. So, so Chuck, I know in the beginning we talked a bit about some misconceptions when it comes to a defensive caliber. Uh, I would love to know before we end today's episode to kind of bring it around full circle. What are some other misconceptions out there when it comes to uh, purchasing defensive rounds on the market today? <laughs> so that it, in, in anything in life in a consumer product, a buyer beware is always in, in play. Being a smart consumer and making good decisions uh, it is it's always important. So one of the reasons that I like having the ballistic gelatin lab is people get to see exactly what bullets do and then they can visualize that inside the, the, the human body. If we're talking about a first aid type of thing, if you're trying to uh, triage a patient or if you're trying to stop a bad guy from doing bad things, uh, all that kind of 3D visualization helps seeing that, I think, in ballistic gelatin. And then part of that lab, I talk about smart ammo selection. You know, what I have found is much more important than what caliber, like 9 millimeter versus 45 versus 10 millimeter versus 380, whatever the case may be, is things like bullet construction and the performance of, of the bullet within the individual. As you can take a large caliber, like a 45 automatic, and give it a crappy bullet and it's going to perform poorly whereas if you have an optimized bullet with a smaller caliber and there's a lot of that that thankfully is out there nowadays for people to choose uh, you can get better performance out of a smaller caliber with the correct bullet than a larger caliber with a poorly chosen bullet unfortunately there's still companies out there that will sell you uh, just garbage ammo. A lot of it is overpriced, uh, more so than than other ammunition choices that would be smarter. So part of what I do in that block is give people the tools to be a smart consumer on picking ammunition for the uh, the type of of you know. Uh, in this case, we're probably going to stick with handguns, but you know, with with carbines, with shotguns, things like that. Uh, it, as an aside, I really got into this in my small guns course, separate from this, in that uh, depending on the size of what what type of handgun you have, if you have a very short barrel handgun, compact handgun versus a full size handgun, barrel length can change the dynamics and the velocity and how that bullet works. Uh, from your gun. So depending on what gun you have, the best bullet for your gun could change. And we talk about, I talk about all of that as far as the ammunition selection. So uh, the question you had before about like, uh, you know, ladies being chastised about carrying a 380, much more important than 380 versus a nine millimeter or something like that would be uh, making sure you have the correct ammo for that gun to optimize that gun. Because you can certainly have 380 ammo that would be uh, pretty effective, and then there are nine millimeter rounds, 40 caliber rounds, 45 caliber rounds on the market that would give worse performance than the 380 with the with the correctly chosen ammo. So, uh, part of the ballistic gelatin demonstration is uh, bringing those points up. Absolutely, no, that's that's incredible to know, and. Uh, do you are there any real life examples where the quality of the bullet has uh, posed questions for uh, caliber or just and then it turned out to be that the quality was the real reason that something happened? One of the one of the most most famous uh, ones that uh, most people are aware of, if they're really nerds in the shooting world, is the 1986 FBI Miami gunfight in which uh, the nine millimeter silver tips that the agents were issued. Uh, gave insufficient penetration to shut down the the main bad guy who went on to shoot seven FBI agents after being shot. Uh, that incident in the FBI led to the standing of uh, the stand up of the FBI ballistic research unit. Uh, brought Dr. Martin Fackler to the fore as far as uh, working the Army Wound Ballistics Lab at the Presidio and uh, really modernizing that that was the driver for modernizing defensive ammunition. Uh, I have seen cases, uh, a local case, it was a liquor store owner uh, who was involved in shooting an, a couple of armed robbers and uh, he had what was an old school famous bullet, uh, the Glazer safety slug 
that gave actually gave very very poor performance even though there is this mythology surrounding this bullet as far as like stopping power uh, the glazer safety slug because of the construction of the bullet gave very very poor penetration very poor performance uh, and thankfully the good guy lived through the event but it wasn't because he made good ammunition choices that day that's for sure Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I'm excited to hear more about that in your uh, in your block at the summit. Uh, that's not something that I've ever even thought about. You know, um, anytime something says critical defense, I'm like, all right, well, here we go. That's it. That's all I needed to know. Uh, so thank you so much <laughs> for bringing attention to that, because uh, that, that is the first step. So I appreciate that so much. Uh, guys, this has been an incredible episode. Holy crap. I've enjoyed this so much. Um, we've had some really fun off-camera moments too uh, with technological issues. So that's been great today. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. Time is the most valuable thing uh, in our lives. So the fact that you came on today means the world to me. Uh, before we sign off today, uh, Steve, please give us the rundown of where, when, and uh, a little bit about the facility, if you don't mind. It looks like a really great place. Okay. Uh, date is November 9 and 10, 2024. The venue is Defender Outdoors, 2900 Shot Street in Fort Worth, Texas. Phenomenal, phenomenal facility. Uh, indoor shooting range. Uh, if you've ever been to Royal Range uh, in... Uh, Nashville. Uh, it kind of reminds me of that in terms of the quality, but they have a much larger pro shop. Uh, the bays very much lend themselves to training. We'll have a bay. We'll have a classroom. Uh, we're limiting this to 20, uh, 20 students. Uh, that is as many as we can handle and do the kind of quality job that we want to do and pay the attention, individual attention to each of the students there. So it's going to be a phenomenal experience is $450. This is a class I I, I, I keep repeating myself. Firearms trainers need to be taking this class. Uh, you can register by going to my website. Uh, we're Palisade Training Group, LLC. The website address is ptgtrainingllc.com. Go to registrations or you can also go directly to Defender Outdoors and register there under their training link. Absolutely. Uh, and if you're if you're not driving right now um, or putting a tourniquet on someone, you can also scroll down to the show notes and uh, access the link there. So I know I'm <laughs> hilarious. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, yes. Thank you guys so much. Oh, good. good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, absolutely, guys. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, November's uh, just the perfect amount of time away to prepare for now. So I'm so glad we got to have this episode. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, for those of you listening, remember, this is available on YouTube. So if you want to go watch it again with video, uh, please do that. Um, for exclusive content, we have a Patreon. We're kind of revamping that right now. So if you're interested in highlights of the episodes, we have those on the She Shield TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, live fire we're everywhere at she shield pod shorts slash highlights are made by lisa hamilton um she's doing a great job there to highlight some fun aspects of the episodes with some awesome b-roll of our guest speakers uh doing the things that they've been talking about so if you want to see highlights from this episode head over there all resources mentioned including how to find each of these gentlemen is in the show notes and if you like the podcast you can like by liking subscribing and leaving a review if anyone you know is a firearms owner experiencing a crisis look into hold my guns Org. They are an organization that will connect you with a local gun shop or FFL to store your firearm for you in a time of need. Thank you for listening. And in the meantime, stay safe and stay vigilant. Attention all knife enthusiasts. Today's episode is sponsored by the one and only Cold Steel Knives. For over three decades, Cold Steel has been leading the way in the knife industry, dedicated to creating the world's strongest and sharpest blades. They've pioneered countless innovations that have become industry hallmarks of quality and sophistication. From their revolutionary checked Kraton handles to the iconic Tonto point blade systems, Cold Steel's progressive accomplishments have set new standards in the field. Their trademark triad locking mechanism remains unrivaled by any of their competitors, proving its unbeatable performance time and time again. Their impressive lineup goes beyond just knives. They offer swords, tomahawks, machetes, 
cutlery, and a wide range of tools for everyday carry. Trusted by military, law enforcement, emergency services, self-defense professionals, and martial arts practitioners, Cold Steel is renowned for quality, strength, reliability, and dependability. Where strength, safety, and performance come together for over three decades and counting. Use code SHESHIELD20, that's S-H-E-S-H-I-E-L-D 20, again, SHESHIELD20, at checkout.